When the Skrin invaded Earth during the Third Tiberium War, they were surprised to find the indigenous population fighting back against them. While the humans were initially surprised and put on the defensive, they quickly turned the conflict around, forcing the alien invaders to focus on the defense of their own bases. Just like the Brotherhood and GDI, the Skrin utilized similar types of defensive turrets. Skrin foremen could also utilize various support powers to aid in defensive and even offensive operations. One thing that all Skrin defense turrets had in common was that they were equipped with sensors that could detect stealth units within the turret's vicinity. For anti-infantry defense, the Skrin had the Buzzer Hive. This hive housed buzzer swarms, though a couple of the swarms typically patrolled the outside of the structure. Once enemy units had been detected, the buzzers would go out and shred them. While human infantry could kill the buzzers before they reached them, the hive would continue to send new buzzer swarms until the structure itself was destroyed. While the buzzer hives were excellent against infantry, they were ineffective against vehicles. For defending their territory against armor, the Skren used the Photon Cannon. This structure, which seems to resemble a small rake with its five claws, would launch plasma discs, which would melt through the armor of vehicles, destroying them. These cannons were best used in conjunction with the buzzer hives. The Photon Cannons were incapable of launching their discs against aircraft so a Skren foreman would need to construct plasma missile batteries to defend their base against such airstrikes. While the plasma missile battery looks different when compared to the photon cannon, it still launched plasma discs, but exclusively against aircraft. What both the photon cannon and plasma missile battery had in common was that they could be upgraded with shard launchers from the technology assembler. These launchers would replace the plasma weapons with Tiberium shards. Green Tiberium Shards, launched at high speeds, could take out both air and ground vehicles faster than the Plasma Discs. The Skrin's most powerful defensive structure was the Storm Column. This tall column with swaying arms would generate a controlled ion storm in the air above it. The radius of this storm would be wider than the column itself. Any enemy units that found themselves within an ion storm would either be destroyed or significantly damaged by the bolts of lightning that it generated. In addition, the Ion Storm could disrupt the guidance system of missiles, sometimes causing them to veer off and miss their intended target. Any Skrin aircraft, such as Storm Riders, Devastator Warships, and Planetary Assault Carriers, that were inside the Ion Storm would have improved armor and be able to cause increased damage to their opponents. They would also be able to receive repairs. Even if the Storm Column was destroyed, the Ion Storm itself would still linger for a short time before fully dissipating launching bolts of lightning at nearby enemies. The downside to the Storm Column, like many defense turrets, was that they were susceptible to long-range artillery from vehicles like the GDI Juggernaut or Nod's Spectre Artillery. A downsized version of the Storm Column, called the Lightning Spike, could be teleported in to almost anywhere on the battlefield. While this turret could be used to support offensive operations, it was primarily used as a quick defense turret a foreman could set up to defend their base. The spike shoots a single bolt of lightning at any nearby enemy ground units. It was most effective against infantry and light vehicles. Unlike other defense turrets, the lightning spike didn't require any power to function. Speaking of power, possibly the most important support structure that the Skrid needed for base functionality and production was the reactor. The primary building was cylindrical shaped, with two large tentacles that were attached to the back and curved around to the front. Fusion heat seems to emanate from the top of the reactor, partially surrounded by moving spikes. The reactor can be upgraded with two fusion cores to generate double the amount of power. Each one of these pods was located at the ends of the reactor's tentacles. Reactors always needed to be placed in an area where they couldn't be easily attacked by enemy forces, but could still be defended by the Skrin's own. With the exception of the Lightning Spike, all base turrets required power to function. Without it, the defenses would be brought offline, making the base vulnerable to hostile attacks. In addition, support buildings like the Nerve Center, Technology Assembler, Stasis Chamber, Signal Transmitter, and Rift Generator would cease to function. Unit production structures could still function with low power, but it would take longer for Skrin units to warp in. The Foundry was a small structure that supported the drone platform during construction of additional buildings. 
This triangular-shaped structure had three moving tentacles, which utilized nano-assemblers to construct buildings. It's important to note that the foundry could not be used to aid in the construction of additional defense turrets, though I believe this is due to gameplay balance, as similar structures like GDI's and Nod's cranes have the same limitation. The nerve center was considered a vital tier 2 structure at a Skrin base, noticeable thanks to its cone shape and the two long moving tentacles protruding out the top. The nerve center would establish contact with more advanced Skrin forces and provide a foreman with a variety of support powers. Without this structure, a foreman would be unable to teleport in the aforementioned lightning spike. The swarm support power would enable a foreman to teleport in a swarm of buzzers almost anywhere on the battlefield, effective at shredding human infantry units. The nerve center was capable of performing a Tiberium vibration scan, which would show the foreman the location of any Tiberium on the battlefield. This wasn't just exclusive to fields of the crystal though. This included any Tiberium being carried by harvesters, stored in refineries, silos, and Tiberium spikes. Not infantry infused with Tiberium could even be detected, as well as power plants upgraded with liquid Tiberium cores and the Nod chemical plant. Interestingly, Tiberium troopers in the Marked of Cain could not be detected by this scan. Infestation was a buzzer hive that could only be teleported onto the chasm of a Tiberium field. The buzzers of this hive would go out and infest the field, attacking and destroying any ground units that attempted to wade through it. This made for a useful area denial weapon against enemy harvesters. However, the infestation could also kill any of the Skrin's own units that happened to move through the field. Destroying the hive was the only way to de-infest a field. The last piece of support the nerve center would provide was called Icor Seed. If a foreman needed more Tiberium at their base, they could contact any Skrin ships in orbit using the nerve center, and the Icor, which is what the Skrin call Tiberium, would be beamed down from orbit. After a few seconds, a small field of Tiberium would be created at the spot, providing more Tiberium compared to the cost of deploying it. Alternatively, Devourer tanks could use the created Tiberium to charge their weapons. The nerve centers contained the key codes that would allow one to access the Skrin's threshold towers. A Nod commander was able to capture one of these nerve centers in the Italian hills, after eliminating Skrin forces protecting the structure. Interestingly, the nerve center is referred to as a, quote, relay node during the mission. If the Skrid wanted to increase the rate at which Tiberium was grown from a chasm, they could construct a growth accelerator right on top of it. The Reaper 17 sect used a more advanced version of this structure called the Growth Stimulator. In addition to increasing the growth rate of Tiberium, the stimulator would generate a small amount of income, similar to the neutral Tiberium spikes that dot the landscape of Yellow Zones. Visually, the stimulator had four cylindrical pods of Tiberium around the main structure itself, whereas the accelerator did not. Once a warp sphere had been constructed, a foreman would gain access to reconstruction drones. Like the swarm support power, reconstruction drones would be teleported anywhere on the battlefield, though the best place to do so would be near damaged screen vehicles, as the drones would repair any damage the vehicles had taken during combat. With the construction of a stasis chamber, a former would gain access to the stasis shield. The stasis shield was a large sphere that could be deployed anywhere on the battlefield. It could be used defensively to shield Skrid units and structures from all incoming damage. However, in exchange for damage immunity, all forces inside, or partially inside the shield, cannot move or fire their weapons. The shield was so powerful that it could even protect forces from an ion cannon or nuclear missile strike. Alternatively, the shield could be used against the enemy, such as halting an attack force to give the foreman time to set up base defenses and build units to protect their base. The phase field was another support power that would provide near immunity to the affected Skrin vehicle units. It would be available once the technology assembler was constructed by the foreman. The phase field didn't just shield units from damage, it would also cause them to temporarily, but partially, phase out of the physical world into another dimension. This made the affected units hard to destroy, but also prevented them from using their primary weapons. This wasn't too much of an issue for phased tripods or eradicator hexapods, as these units could easily crush most enemy vehicles beneath their legs. Still, if the affected units were on the verge of being destroyed, the phase field could prevent that from happening. The phase field more than likely utilized the same technology as the phase generators. 
The phase generators were spherical-shaped structures used to keep the threshold towers immune to all damage while under construction. Due to their importance, these generators were priority targets for GDI when attacking the thresholds. The tower under construction in Rome was protected by three of these phase generators, though only one was needed to protect the entire tower. All three were successfully taken out by the GDI commander, making the tower vulnerable and ripe for destruction with an ion cannon strike. The success against the Threshold Tower in Rome was replicated against all other Skrin towers, leaving only one left standing. The last tower, Threshold 19, was protected by a total of six phase generators during its construction, three on one side of the tower and three on the other. While the Skrin managed to hold off GDI's assault on one side, the Brotherhood of Nod intervened and destroyed GDI forces assaulting the other side. Once completed, the tower was invulnerable to all damage and no longer needed the phase generators to protect it. With the construction of a caterpillar-shaped structure called the Signal Transmitter, the Skrin were able to call in more powerful forms of battlefield support. This included wormholes and temporal wormholes for the Traveler 59 sect. For the wormhole, the former would create two portals, the first acting as the entrance point and the second as the exit point. All ground units that entered the first portal would be instantly transported to the location of the second portal. These portals were not limited to Skrin use, as both GDI and Nod ground units could also make use of them to transport their own units. The wormhole only lasted about 25 seconds before collapsing. A popular strategy was to open a wormhole next to an enemy mobile construction vehicle and send a mastermind or a prodigy through to mind control said MCV. From here, the foreman could either sell off the MCV or have it move through the wormhole to the Skrin base, giving the foreman access to human technology and weapons. The Reaper 17 sect didn't make use of wormholes, instead replacing them with shock pods. This allowed the sect to teleport in veteran shock troopers almost anywhere on the battlefield. Traveler 59 had a different kind of wormhole called the Tempora wormhole. When activated, anything caught within this bubble would be slowed. This was due to time flowing at a different rate compared to the world outside the bubble. Units' movement speed and fire rates were reduced. This effect even applied to structures, slowing turrets' fire rates and the production time of unit-producing buildings. The temporal wormhole only lasted about 30 seconds, but could be useful in slowing down an attacking force or protecting one's own from incoming projectiles. A signal transmitter was the only structure that could warp in the most powerful Skrin aircraft, the Mothership. While slow moving, the Mothership was a heavily armored command hub of a Skrin foreman. Armed with a catalyst cannon, the Mothership was capable of leveling entire cities and military bases. Once it fires, the shockwave given off by the initial blast spreads to all other units and structures nearby, causing a destructive chain reaction of explosions. This made the Mothership a high-priority target for both GDI and Nod forces to destroy. The final support power available to a Skrin foreman from the signal transmitter was Overlord's Wrath. When used, a couple of small Tiberium-laced meteors came crashing down on the designated target, followed shortly afterward by a large meteor, causing damage to any units or structures caught within the impact radius. Both the positive and negative effect of the meteor's impact was that it left behind a patch of Tiberium that could be harvested. A small non-damaging ion storm hovers above the impact site, causing new Tiberium crystals to grow. While the initial strike could damage a human base, the left behind Tiberium could be harvested by the humans and used to rebuild. Alternatively, if the meteors were not used offensively and landed close to the Skrin base, then their harvesters could make use of the extra Tiberium. The support power seems to be a homage to how Tiberium first arrived on Earth in 1995, through a single meteor which crashed near the Tiber River in Italy. This seems to imply that the Skrin send out Tiberium-laced meteors across the galaxy to land on planets and seed them with Tiberium. Once the Tiberium has matured, a Skrin mining force is sent in to harvest and transport it back to i Hub through their newly constructed Threshold Towers. Just like GDI and the Brotherhood, the Skrin had their own unique superweapon called the Rift Generator. This tall structure featured four long spikes on the outside corners and two more in the middle. At the tips of these spikes was what looks to be a small portal. Inside this portal appears to be an entire galaxy. Whether it's the Milky Way galaxy or some other is unknown. 
The super weapon takes a few minutes to charge up before it can be used. One knew when the rift generator was fully charged by the mass of, I guess, matter surrounding the small portal at the top of the structure. GDI forces first encountered this weapon while assaulting the Threshold Tower in Rome. The rift generator makes the science behind our own ion cannon look downright primitive. It appears to function by opening a portal at the flashpoint and ejecting anything that's caught in the resulting field into deep space. Some of our more robust structures have been able to hold out against such an attack, but the rift generator's destructive capabilities are on par with the GDI ion cannon and Nod nuclear missiles. As mentioned, the rift generator's attack was devastating to units and structures caught within the radius of the large portal created at the target location. Interestingly, while the portal is active, a wave of, again, what I'm just going to say is matter, can be seen emitting skywards from the structure itself. While the rift generator may have been the ultimate spread weapon, the ultimate support structure was the alien control node. This unique structure was the only one of its kind, and was built at Ground Zero in Italy the spot where Tiberium first appeared on Earth. From what GDI could deduce, the control node regulates the flow of Tiberium radiation to all the Skrin's forces located on and beyond Earth. The alien control node at Ground Zero is a unique structure that seems to channel some form of exotic Tiberium-based radiation to the invader forces. The emissions from the control node move easily through all forms of matter, much like neutrino wave particles and so this one node structure is easily able to bathe every invader unit and structure on Earth with a mysterious radiation. In fact, this one control node could easily supply a uniform bath of radiation to alien units as far away as Earth's moon. What is this radiation, and why is it needed? Is it for power? Communications? Synchronization? Coordination and control? Does it provide something essential for the alien machines or the organic matter inside? We don't know the answers to any of these questions, but we do believe that the control node is the key vulnerability for the aliens. Take out the control node, and there is a good chance the whole invasion will end quickly. Assaulting the alien control node proved challenging for the GDI commander, as it was heavily defended by both Skrin and Nod forces. However, the commander was ultimately successful in destroying it. The destruction of the control node brought about the end of the alien invasion, or at least what was left of it with Skrin units, vehicles, and structures collapsing all over the world. The last support structure of the Skrin, which I've already mentioned throughout this video, were the Threshold Towers. During the invasion of Earth, 19 of these enormous towers were being constructed in the planet's red zones. Built by drones from a Tiberium composite material, the tower's purpose, once completed, was to act as an interstellar gateway, capable of transferring a large amount of Tiberium off Earth. Threshold Tower construction is the first stage of planetary i extraction. Thresholds are capable of extracting all i within a large radius. i will be processed and transferred to Hub. Connection with Hub takes the form of an interstellar gateway capable of instantaneous matter transmission. Threshold assemblies and signal transmitters will partially phase out once construction is complete. Phasing will completely protect all threshold structures and machinery against any form of geologic upheaval, severe weather phenomena, cometary impact, or use of conventional nuclear, i or other forms of weaponry. GDI had no idea why the Skrin were constructing these towers, but weren't going to wait for their completion to find out. Thanks to data deciphered from the Tacitus, Kane was aware that the towers functioned as interstellar gateways, and that access to them held the secrets of Tiberium, and perhaps even, control of the universe. Unfortunately for both the Brotherhood and Skrin, GDI managed to destroy all but one tower, Threshold 19, located in the Mediterranean Red Zone, just off the coast of southern Italy. With the help of the Brotherhood, the Skrin were able to complete construction on Threshold 19, with Foreman 371 and the other surviving Skrin forces making their way through the tower, back to i Hub. Afterwards, the Brotherhood of Nod gained access to the tower using the key code they had stolen from the nerve center in the Italian hills. In 2052, with the help of Legion and the Tacitus, Kane was able to stop Threshold 19 from being activated by the Skrin on i Hub, preventing a second invasion of Earth. At least, for now. Should the Skrin manage to activate the tower and send a second invasion force through, then humanity will have to face both old and new forces of the Skrin, aided by a variety of defenses, support structures, and powers. 